meltdown, by the way, Mark. I didn't know about the book. What mortgage meltdown was averted? Well, let's remember that in March 2020, we came very close to a financial crisis, particularly in the mortgage market with among mortgage REITs, with among money market mutual funds. So part of the book is to really walk you through that stress we went through in 2020. But the other part of it is how we kept, you know, foreclosures from getting out of control. You know, as a reminder, we lost uh, 22 million jobs in that spring of COVID. Uh, and any time you lose that number of jobs, you really face the potential of mass foreclosures in the mortgage market. In so in a sense, it's the shoe that didn't drop. So I thought it was important to write the story of why it didn't drop and why we stopped it from dropping. And maybe that's a good segue to the, the shoe that has dropped yes. at uh, SVB and uh, why you don't, or let's put it this way, you say you don't support the idea of backstopping old deposits, but that's functionally what we have in place right now, isn't it? It is. I mean, although I, even after today, I think there's some ambiguity of whether you're a small community bank in, you know, Oklahoma or Louisiana, and if you're under a billion in assets, are your uninsured depositors really backed? So I think there's a bit of ambiguity here. It certainly, you know, we know uh, Secretary Yellen has gone back and forth. So unfortunately, that answer is not 100 percent clear. You know, obviously, if you're probably at a SIFI, uh, one of the largest banks as an insured depositor, you're backed. But ultimately, this is a decision that needs to be made by Congress. You know, Congress set the 250. It's not up to the regulators to make this permanent. Uh, and again, we'll find out whether that's true or not going forward and whether Congress changes this. But I want to take a little different, you know, well, let me focus on why sure. I'm against the expansion. W one second before I get into that, because Steve, what are you hearing on that front? So again, the whole point of this is to figure out we have this kind of de facto uh, if that's the right term, uh, coverage of deposits right now. And everybody says, oh, we can't keep it this way and we can't keep it this way. But what steps might Congress actually take as far as you can tell to change uh, that, keep it from being enshrined? Well, if I could look at the negative, uh, like a picture on this and answer the question, the Biden administration hasn't proposed it to Congress. So that might tell you where they think the votes are, or in this case, I believe, aren't. I don't think they have support for it yet. Otherwise, they'd put it in. It may be one of those situations, unfortunately, like if you remember the TARP vote, Kelly, when it went down the first time, the market fell 700 points, they right. went back and they put it back in. Um, I, I want to respond. I want Mark to make his argument about why he's against 250 and I want to respond to that because I have a slightly different point of view, even though, of course, <laughs> I have great respect for Mark. Uh, in a nutshell, if you could, Mark. Uh, and, I, and I appreciate how the, the respect is mutual. And so I want to take the other side of this and say, you know, the uninsured depositors forcing the closure of Silicon Valley Bank was a good thing because the regulators were at least six months, if not a year, behind the curve. If the uninsured depositors had not forced this bank to close, who knows how long it would have taken? The hole could have gotten deeper and deeper. And again, you look at like the savings and loan crisis. You look at 2008. One of the primary problems is that bank regulators take too long to, to act. And so, again, this, to my view, was not some sort of, you know, mindless panic run. The bank was insolvent. And uninsured depositors forced the regulators to do something about it that they wouldn't have done with otherwise. Steve? So Mark is right about that, uh, and, and there's a legitimate question about whether or not on that, Steve? Uh, depositors. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. Can I quote Steve. you on that? Mark was right. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a legitimate question as to whether or not uh, depositors, uh, equity holders, and other people ought to have access to what the supervisors have access to. My point is against this moral hazard issue relative to the depositors, and I've made this point before, Kelly. I'll make it again. If the supervisors don't see it enough to shut down the bank, the equity holders don't see it enough to shut down the bank, the bondholders aren't pulling their money out or selling their bonds, how in God's name are the depositors supposed to see it? These are mostly folks trying to run their businesses and really want the financial system to operate in the background. The idea that they're enforcing any discipline on the banks, to me, is suspect at best. Right, and I should add, Mark, as you kind of respond to that, no one was ever looking at this metric until this crisis happened. You know, if people who do banks and bank, I mean, the, un, the percentage of uninsured deposits is now, uh, you know, obvious, but it certainly wasn't a short time ago. And Mark, I also just want to point out a couple of these weak banks, First Republic, PacWest, I mean, we're sure. seeing them trade down another five, six percent again today. I'm just curious if you could comment on that, because it does seem like it would be connected to the idea that, you know, maybe everything isn't going to stay covered. 
So, uh, you know, it is a great concern, and it's important to keep in mind that Silicon Valley Bank had at least a half a dozen problems, and even the First Republics only have a small number of those problems. So I didn't really walk away from the hearing this morning seeing what the evidence of contagion is. And again, to also emphasize, you don't need 100 percent of depositors. You know, we know prices are set at the margin. That's Econ 101. All you need is a small sliver. Five percent of depositors monitoring institution can result in market discipline. So, again, I would disagree with an argument that you need everybody monitoring. But, again, I think there's a small segment. And, again, most of those banks, we publicly know the information on uninsured depositors, the, un, the unrecognized losses in securities. Again, we've all seen those names out there. We know the half a dozen or so that are problematic. And I really want to emphasize, it's largely limited at this point to those half a dozen. So where, so to, where would you say, let's say someone came to you, Mark, and said, okay, I'm a customer at First Republic, what do I do? Well, I, I think, again, if you are somebody who's got over 250, you can put it in multiple banks. There are a number of services that allow you to, including private insurance, but there's the services that will allow you to have to divide those banks. That's the interesting thing is, the great thing about capitalism, you can pay someone else to monitor it for you. And there are services that do that. So to me, it does speak to the relative unsophistication. I agree with Steve. Nobody wants to monitor their bank. But again, you can buy services that do that for you.